Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meets Social and Emotional Learning podcast, episode number 79. Today we have Eric Jensen, a leading authority on the science and applications of brain research and education for more than 20 years. For those who are new here, my name is Andrea Samadhi, and I'm a former educator who created this podcast to bring the most current neuroscience and educational research matched with social and emotional skills with interviews from experts who've risen to the top of their field with specific strategies or ideas that you can implement immediately to take your results to the next level. Thank you so much, Eric, for coming on the podcast today. Where have I reached you? So today I'm in San Diego, which is where I grew up. So I've been doing a little bit of traveling lately. So it's good to be back in the home territory. Wonderful. Are you actually doing workshops with schools right now out there or traveling? I have been working with some schools and uh, districts around the country, but it's been a little bit spotty just because of the times that we live in. So uh, on and off, virtual and in addition, live. So a little of each. Perfect. Well, I want to give a little bit more background of your work because it's been a busy 20 years for you. Dr. Eric Jensen is a former teacher and a top 30 global guru. He co-founded an academic enrichment program that's held in 16 countries with over 85,000 graduates. Jensen has authored over 30 books, including three bestsellers, with his two most recent being Brain-Based Learning, that's in its third edition, and Poor Students, Rich Teaching. He's also a member of the Invitation Only Society for Neuroscience. Eric, I know that your background has been focused on students in poverty and how poverty impacts the brain and learning, uh, specifically as it relates to trauma and stress. And our stress levels just seem to be jumping up to new levels as new stressors arise with this global pandemic. But we've got it handled here. Uh, we've got both parents working together to support our children but I can't help thinking about the families that don't have resources or the support that they need. And I'd love to hear your thoughts of solutions that teachers and families could be looking for to support students at this critical time in our world. Is that a good place for us to start the podcast? Sounds like a good place. I think when we bring up the topic of poverty, the reality is that there are you know, middle-class families all over the world that are struggling. There are, of course, upper-class families that struggle in different ways. Those in poverty just have additional barriers because sometimes not having enough resources can make life more difficult for you. So it's always tough to generalize about these, but we can say that there are correlations. Those who grow up poor are more likely to have more of the adverse childhood experience experiences. They're more likely to uh, experience discrimination if they're a person of color, and they're more likely to not be able to buy their way out of a problem. And so because of that, every tool that we can provide is going to be helpful. I just want to begin, though, with something important to say about not just poverty, but about how our brain works in regards to stressors. So our brain is designed to keep us alive. If we keep the mantra again and again and again, any species on this planet doesn't stick around very long unless its focus is on survival. And our brain is designed to interpret signals from the environment. So the environmental signals that can trigger stressors for our brain, there's only two of them, and that's it. And once you understand what the two triggers are, then it helps you work backwards and to say, okay, in my own life and in the world around me, how do I prevent these triggers from getting pushed? The first trigger is that your brain filters input on a basis of whether it's behaviorally relevant or not. So another way to say that is if I flip on the evening news and it says there's been a big mudslide in Kashmir, well, you might say, God, that's terrible. But if you don't know anybody that lives there and it's not behaviorally relevant to you, you might flip onto the next channel and watch something else. Mm -hmm. So relevance is your core initial screening tool for all stressors. 
In other words, there are people that walk around and just make things in their brain less relevant. And it's a life skill to be able to make the right things relevant in your life and other things not relevant. And many people aren't very good at screening that because they either don't have the skills for it or they don't understand the relevance of relevance. Right. So the first thing to understand about our brain and stress is that relevance is the opening gate for our stressors. Like, is it relevant or is it not? The second thing is, can I do anything about it? Which we call our sense of control. So if something bad appeared to be happening either because of a person or situation, but you could do a lot to mitigate it, you might just get juiced up and excited and revved about solving the problem versus getting exceedingly stressed. So nearly everything that I suggest falls in those two territories. And it's important to keep in mind that you can go after the issue of stress in many ways. Your brain actually has designed more than just those two layers when we start breaking them down into sort of the micro layers. But that's the macro picture, is that once you can mitigate or influence or alter what's relevant to you, and what you can do about your life, then you start saying, oh, this is better. Just as when you mentioned you were getting your kids set up at home for distance learning, the more tiny things that parents can help kids have some sense of control over, like where do we put the desk? Well, where would you feel most comfortable for that? Where would you like this lighting? Like these sound trivial in the grand scheme of life, and they are, but in the moment, tiny choices add up to a greater sense of, ah, I did it the way I felt I could be more in charge of. So that's the starting point for the, all of the conversations about it. So those who are poor typically have fewer resources for dealing with these. Like resource could be knowledge. A resource could be access to money or resource could be lack of access to supportive people or relationships or contacts to help them get out of a jam. And that's the, what makes it difficult for people who grow up in poverty. Well, that, that, this is a whole new way of me looking at it. I, I thought that the answer was going to go a different way. And I've never really thought about giving choices to make a child feel more in control. And that makes sense to me because no one likes to be told what to do. Absolutely. And sometimes as a classroom teacher or a parent, you have to sell the choice, meaning, well, we need this. This is important for us to get done. Would you rather do this? now or in about 10 or 11 minutes. So if I can choose it, I feel a little bit better because there's always the, the headspace of the devaluation of future work. Like, oh, that's out in the future. That won't be as painful as it would be right now. Mm -hmm. So using what we know about how our brain works is really key if you wanna be not just to survive in a more stressful context that we appear to be in now, but also to be one that absolutely thrives in it. So when we begin with the topic of stressors, the very first layer, just from the uh, kind of the, the, the of, of how we respond, how do we even interpret things about what's relevant, what's not, we have to ask ourselves the question, how much are we stressing ourselves out? Mm -hmm. And I'm around people every day that I see are either really good at this or terrible at this. So mm -hmm. here's a simple way to understand, are you stressing you out? Example would be, if you hear someone else say, this is how it is, and you go, oh, like a big response. My question is, in your brain, did you think that the world is going to work perfectly according to every whim you have and nobody will ever mess up or uh, have a imperfection? Did you think that? And of course, people would say, no, I don't believe that. And I'll say, well, someone just messed up and you just threw a fit. So clearly there's a disconnect in your brain 
about what you claim to believe, but how you respond. So when, pe- when you see things that appear to be annoying or disruptive or uh, not predicted, my question is, are you aligned in your brain with this? Or do you just do a every moment shoot from the hips response, which is reactive about it? For example, you're driving down the road and suddenly the, the, the driving goes from smooth to the traffic's backed up. And you go, oh, I hate this traffic. Every time you do that, listen to what you just said. You're saying, I'm unhappy with something I can't control, and I'm making that relevant. Notice how you just messed with your brain. So either make traffic something you don't really care about unless you're on the way to the hospital to give birth, mm-hmm. you know, either make traffic something that's less important or do what some people do is they try to find a workaround as in I will listen to a podcast while I'm driving and entertain myself or I'll find alternative route B. Notice how there's all these alternatives for how to handle how you control that feeling or you can handle the relevance of it differently. Does that resonate? It does. Now here I want to apply it to a child in poverty. Is, is, is this what you're saying builds resilience that the child is, doesn't have the resources that they need, that they learn to adapt? Is that what the brain needs to do? To, so that, that that child can keep learning and be resilient and not get frustrated with the things they might need? Or how do, how do they use this strategy? Well, it's a little bit messier than we wish it was. But I'll say, anytime you generalize about uh, humankind, a skin color, an ethnicity, or a socioeconomic class, you can get into trouble. But I'm going to do a little bit of generalization, Okay. okay. So the first thing we could say is that as a general rule, poor are more likely to have chronic and acute stressors in their life. And part of this comes from not having the awareness about that I'm doing this to myself. But you could argue this also happens to middle class people and upper class people. Mm -hmm. So let's back up a little bit and say what kinds of stressors. A chronic stressor would be things such as a a lack of quality medical care, or it could be a noisy or violent neighborhood, or it could be lack of quality food, or it could be airplanes overhead landing and taking off because they're near an airport. So they're more likely to have chronic stressors. Chronic stressors are the kind that go up in your brain and they just stay up. They just keep going and going and going and going. Chronic or acute stressors are absolutely toxic for the brain. Why? Because your brain says, this is really bad to keep you alive. I'm going to help you adapt to it. So how people adapt to chronic stressors is that people will typically and the, the brain does this automatically. Chronic stressors in kids, regard, and, and this happens in adults, but in kids, chronic stressors give your brain two options. Scientists aren't quite sure why your brain picks either of these two options, but with chronic stressors, you're more likely to get students who say, I'm going to quit caring about things. So if you flip the relevant switch off, you'll get kids that show up at school like arms folded. I don't give a rip. Okay. Yeah. So that's one option to not be stressed is if you don't make anything relevant. Mm -hmm. Now, usually, but not always, that happens when somebody's been burned as in They made an adult relevant in their life and their adult hurt them. Or they made an adult relevant and adult got killed or died of cancer or put in jail, things like that. Mm -hmm. So another option is to survive is you could make things not relevant or you could 
become like what you see in PTSD victims, somebody who becomes hypervigilant. So hypervigilant means I'm on edge all the time because anything that shifts just the least bit, I'm going to jump in and try to get control. So in the classroom, if a teacher says to a kid, hey, it's way too noise in here. Can you just cut it out or knock it off? That might be a trigger for a kid just to go crazy nuts and stand up for him or herself and tell the teacher where to go and what to do. Mm -hmm. And the teacher who doesn't understand stress disorders would say something silly to the kid, like knock it off or you're going to the office or things like that. Mm -hmm. When in fact, the kid's actually fighting for his life. What he's really saying to the teacher is, I need control over this situation because when I was little and I didn't do anything, it cost me my mom. Mm -hmm. Or I couldn't do anything. Our house burnt down. Or I couldn't do something and we were assaulted. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the residue in the brain for becoming a PTSD person is that if I don't take action, and on you in particular, the residue is help, help me get in control. So notice what the two different responses that you would see is somebody to say, I don't care anymore. And in the classroom, the teacher inappropriately believes that kid is an unmotivated kid. Right. Or the kid who becomes hypervigilant, who is the one that will always try to be the bully and the one that tries to get their way and the tr one that tries to control things in the classroom. Does that make it, does that resonate? It does because I taught behavioral students and I wish I knew this back then because it was me and the buzzer on the wall and then these 30 students that that I had to rely on and I didn't know any strategies. And when I asked for support, the principal sent me to a tribes workshop. That's all we had back in the, in the late nineties in Toronto. But so now I understand this a lot better, but what do you, what kinds of strategies would you encourage? Let's say a teacher in the classroom, how would they re react differently with trauma knowledge in the brain and mind or a parent how do you deal with this type of behavior in the home if you know that there's stressors that you just can't control well there's because it's hard to know up front about how their brain will respond you're going to tiptoe into this for example some kids have quit engaging in a classroom and they may do this with a COVID experience, quit engaging because out of fear, they figure I've just learned to shut down. I've learned to quit. So that person isn't trusting. They aren't trusting the environment. They aren't trusting adults because now their adults have sort of stuck it to them with this disease. Mm -hmm. So they aren't quite sure who they should trust. And so building trust in little tiny increments is critical. That would mean in a first grade classroom, the teacher who does the me bag activity and shares small little bits about their life and then says, I've got you covered. I'll look after you. I know just what to do. That's the starting point is the rebuilding of relationships because some kids, they will never move forward until they can trust an adult who may be representing somebody in their past that burned them. Right. So small baby steps of trust with the teacher is critical or the parent is critical. Now, those little things can start with tiny disclosures, asking calming questions, giving choices in the classroom. What would you rather do? What do you think is important? How does this feel, the mask feel on your face? Oh, yeah, I felt that same way. Yeah, I understand. That sort of thing. So small, tiny, calming tools and also giving them more control and selling the control. Like control would mean a student's in charge of something in a classroom and they know how to do it. It could mean a job in a classroom, but if you're home by yourself, it could be that the teacher says, now, 
what department is this going to be in on your desk at home? Ah, so that's your tools department, okay? So go ahead and point to your tools department and say, that's mine, that's mine. Now this sounds tiny, it sounds trivial, but now the kids are saying, I got this, I got that. I can move this department over there for tools. So giving them choices, giving them jobs, asking them for feedback about things such as how did we do today? Let's start with what you thought about what I did. What could I do better at next time we meet? So that every time the kids get their voice heard, they get a chance to give feedback. And remember, this gives them a tiny sense of control once again. Like, I have influence over my teacher's uh, virtual class, <clears throat> and that helps me say I could help things maybe go a little bit more the way I need it. Mm -hmm. So notice how a lot of these show up in just little tiny layers. They're incremental, but in the kid's brain, they're really a big, big deal. I love these ideas and suggestions. They're giving them the choice. It just makes so much sense to me because that's when they they start to respond and communicate back, and that's when we're learning. Well, these are sort of your uh, frontline first responder tools just to get the process up and working. The reality is is that you're brain and body have set up many different layers of response for things like stressors and those that are pretty good at it. They learn to catch their own self-talk. They learn to catch their language, which is like your brain's first, you know, immediate, you know, as Daniel Kahneman would say, sort of this is your sort of your step one brain that's just being just responding instantly and catching that every time you catch yourself complaining about something. If you can't do something about it, look for the good in it. If it's a bad thing, either make it less relevant or increase your control or smile and say amor fati, which is a Latin phrase for embrace the moment. Like whatever's in front of you just to embrace that. I say that because otherwise you're going to stress yourself out 20 or 30 times a day. And at the end of the day, the residue is in your body. Now the question is how are you going to clear that out? So your first stage in reducing stress is self-awareness. Like if you can't even be aware of how you stress you out, and that includes you pointing fingers at other people, because the reality is people, others don't stress you out. You stress you out. So the first thing is awareness. The second is prevention. Preventing your body from becoming stressed means developing a cadre of small protective tools. That includes small, tiny habits that let you reset to get back in control. That could mean you're in charge of setting up consciously little things that you do every day to kind of reset your day. So the tiny, if you might want to call this prevention tools, would be things like, do you exercise X number of days per week? Do you keep locking in on what do I have control over? Do you have a supportive network of friends that you can talk to or email? Do you take actionable steps whenever you start to feel stressed out? Like yesterday, I was feeling a lot of stress in my body, and I said, I know what I need to do, you know? And so I went out, jumped in the pool, and I swam laps. So swimming laps stresses the body. But on the other hand, I amp up the stress. I do things like I hold my breath on every single lap I swim because now I'm building cardio. And so holding laps and swimming cardio strengthens my stress responses. Now, sometimes on an extra good day, I'll do math in my brain just because that adds one more stressor to my brain. So the takeaway from this is the more things that you work hard to build that little buffer against you and the outside world, and of course having that unshakable optimism is really important. 
So I'm always going to keep tiny habits in in line. I'm going to eat for myself. I'm going to make sure that I eat the foods that are good for me. Uh, and I'm going to make sure that just my own self-talk is strong so that just that first layer of things that come at me stress-wise, I've already got a little bit of what you might call protection. So the first layer that when we talk about reducing stressors in our brain, our first layer is self-awareness. Then there's the prevention layer. Then there's the resistance layer. Like how on earth do you sort of resist that stressor? And part of that is you need a healthy identity. Like if you keep telling yourself, oh, I'm such a basket case, that identity creates vulnerabilities for you. You want to say, it's a rough moment, but I got this. Or I know I can take this because I've done it before. It also means that you keep pulling yourself back on track to what do I have some control over in my life? Like, doing laundry, folding clothes. There's a lot of control in that. It sounds simple, but hand washing dishes, it's simple, but it's in control. The other thing is being in control of your body. That means that I've made one more thing, sort of a defensive barrier in my life, which is I do my best to be in charge of the foods that I eat and don't let my foods run me. So I do things like intermittent fasting. I do things like choose fewer foods, but choose better foods. And I make sure that the foods I choose help strengthen my immune system. For example, during this particular time in what's going on in the world, zinc is a very good compound to keep in your system, but zinc gets metabolized better with quercetin, which is an important cofactor. Unless you combine those two together, you don't get the high absorption rate for zinc. So starting to piece together good nutrition along with healthy eating creates one more layer in that process. So once you've got awareness, prevention, some resistance, the resiliency is the bounce back from, like how do I bounce back from this? And that includes things like having a strong sense of hope. Because when everybody experiences you know bad times the question is when they are bad what's the story in your head if the story in your head is this too shall pass that's okay but what would be better is i can already see a light at the end of the tunnel or already i'm getting making some moves that's going to help accelerate my progress out of this so being aware just of stories you tell and be aware of the identity you have about all of this is pretty important. So I'm going to suggest that you can go after chronic stress, acute stressors, and just daily nibbling of the stressors in a lot of different ways. Ultimately, what you want is to make sure is that you align what you believe in, which is that people are good, but they make mistakes. People are good, but they have imperfections. Every time your partner disappoints you, instead of going, oh, why why are you doing this to me? Mm -hmm. Just taking a deep breath and just say to yourself, you know what, I've done the same. Just relax about it. The idea behind this is that people have way more to do with how their stress is in their body, in their brain, in their emotions, than they want to give themselves credit for. And the bad news about this is that many times you tell people this and they go, oh, that makes so much sense. Yeah, that's good to know I can work on that. But how badly do you want it? You know, I've been working on these these stress insights and stress tools for 20 years to get me to the point where I can feel pretty good about it, but I still get stressed. It's just not the deep level. It's not as often. You know what I'm saying? And when it happens, I have better tools for it. So if somebody thinks this is overwhelming, stop the negative self-talk. Just say to yourself, I can do this much, just this much, and get myself on the path. That's all it takes is get yourself started. So now you've been working on this for 20 years, and I feel like, 
I, I'm about 20 years working on habits and routines. What about our kids? Their prefrontal cortexes are not developed. How, how long is it gonna take them now to develop this? Well, many people have heard um, things out there called, you know, you form a new habit in 21 days. There is no science behind that. So that came out in a book that came out 30 plus years ago. The people that do the hardcore research on habit changes, these are the ones that use real people in the real world trying to change real habits. And what they've discovered is that how long it takes to form a habit depends on what type of habit and what type of person and whether the habit is pleasure forming or it's not. In other words, there's and how many repetitions. So there's a lot of parameters around it. So everybody needs to throw out the 21 day myth. Right. You can form a new habit in five seconds. Example, Put your hand on a hot stove and you probably won't ever do it again. But in a classroom, teachers who use routines that are cue-based, as in you cue it with a tonality of voice, a spatial trigger, or music, or time of day, can create new habits and new routines for their students in literally a week so that students already know the routines. And these are critical. If you do not do these with your students, you will struggle. They can do these at home. All you need to do is to tell them in real simple words. First, start with this. You need something that's gonna cue it, like a trigger. Mm -hmm. Then you need to be clear on what you're going to do and what you're gonna do if you get distracted or if you forget, we all call that a plan B. And then how are you going to reward your brain? It's like there's actually a dozen ways you can go about forming habits, but all of those require something that'll trigger it, a process, a plan B, and a reward, but it can be done in many different ways. So the takeaway from this is teachers in the classroom, start fostering routines for your kids at home that they can begin that help them feel more in control. The routine could be even a song for putting on and taking off a mask at the end, the start of a class and the end of the class and make it a short little clip that's fun and reminds them of why we do this. You can write a song to maybe the melody of another piece of music that we all do it together. So that's an example of a routine. A routine is getting ourselves with our posture up straight, our mindset straight, our tools are on our desk, and our assignments in front of us. And we take slow, deep breaths. Nose breathing keeps the parasympathetic system going instead of your sympathetic system going so that students have a brain calming, mind calming, action set, uh, body, mind with your posture that you've got your stuff out, you've got a sense of control. When they set up all of those cues, kids are usually pretty ready to go. Most teachers assume kids will do something like that, and they're dead wrong. Kids don't know how to do that, so the teacher's got to break down every single piece of the habits. I love these ideas. This is very helpful, specifically at this time of year. Now, I just want to ask, because I've heard you say before that our DNA is not our destiny. And I just loved hearing this because we definitely don't choose our parents. And next week, I'm actually speaking with the founder of the 16th Strong Project. She created this project out of Harvard's Grad School of Education to show other young people that ACEs can be mitigated. So in your 20 years of working with schools and students with a focus on low-income students, what stories have you heard where kids were able to change their brains for their better? And how do you think they did this? Uh, first of all, for those that are not oriented towards the ACE study, just 30 seconds of background. Uh, the head of the Kaiser Permanente Group in San Diego, uh, Dr. Felitti, got together with the head of the CDC in Atlanta, Dr. Anda, they started talking at a conference and says, wow, you've got data on this. We've got data on this. We should find out if there's any correlation between this and this. 
they created a simple survey that said, did the following happen to you under the age of 16? And they chose things such as physical abuse, emotional abuse, separation of parents, evictions, um, you know, drug usage in a household and so forth. So what they discovered is that those who had higher scores on the ACE survey, meaning more of those bad things happened, it was correlated with later life adversity. And that meant behavior problems with kids in school. It meant lower rates of graduation, health problems, and ultimately early death. So that's the backstory on this. Over 70 studies have been published on the ACE studies themselves, the original ones that came out. And they're, they're absolutely enlightening and valuable for people to read. The caveat about them that everyone should know is not one of the ACE studies ever asked the simple question about what resources do you have in order in your life. It was all about what was bad. As an example, uh, when I've taken the ACE, ACEs surveys, there's, uh, there's different mod uh, variations on the, the quiz, but there's about 10 of them, give or take more or less items. Out of the 10, I had seven of those, which is extreme outlier on the bad side. Mm -hmm. Seven of those. 50% of the people in the United States have two or less. So mm -hmm. that's an important understanding. So I had seven of them. So how did I get to where I am? Well, it took a lot of factors that give clear evidence that it's possible for you to change your brain. Luck was one of them. Right place, right time, met the right people. That's an example. But I had to seize the opportunity when I was there in that moment too. Yeah. So it takes a combination of habits inertia, will, luck, a lot of things for people to get out of that. So I want to back up to the ACEs and say not one of those studies, as I said earlier, not one of those asks about resources. So teachers in class who get overwhelmed by the ACEs study think, oh, my kids, they might have a lot of these ACEs. It's true. But if you ever Googled famous people who grew up in poverty, you'll get this huge list of people who grew up in poverty. So it shows you that having bad things happen doesn't mean everything's going to turn out bad. So there are schools all over the country, and I'm going to guess around the world, but I know those in the United States better, that have 100% of the kids from poverty, and every year they send, and it's only because it's one of many markers. You can use a lot of different markers. Every year they send 95 to 100% of their kids off to universities. Mm -hmm. One of the schools I worked with uh, was in San Diego. This, it's a public school. It's a combined middle and high school. And this school, uh, every year between 95 and 100% of their kids will go off to universities. And in the state of California, there's over 10,400 schools. And this school is ranked academically every year between number five and number nine in the state. Academically, meaning it's that hard. Right. So when people say you can't do it, I'd say, okay, let me give you another school. It's in the south side of Chicago. This school is 100% African-American. It's a boys-only school, urban prep. Every year they graduate 100% of their kids and they send them all off to colleges and universities. And if you think, yeah, but they probably drop out. No, they don't. They stay in school at double the national averages. And if you think they send them just to certain schools that are easy, they don't. They've gone to 150 different colleges and universities and they've earned over 15 million in scholarships. I asked the principal of the school, Dr. Lionel Allen, I said, when people ask you, what's the secret sauce? How do you get these schools to turn kids from poverty to being like world class, you know, graduates? And he said, it's so simple. Nobody takes me seriously. And I say, so what's an example? He said, we form good habits. We build strong relationships. We make school relevant. We make sure it's culturally appropriate for our kids. Like, we have high expectations. I mean, you hear those everywhere, but this school actually does that. So my favorite quote 
from the formal principal to school. And by the way, they've done this for 11 consecutive years. There's no luck in that, 11 years straight. When I asked him, you know, what do you say to people who say, yeah, but, and he said to me, it was just so profound. He said, when people say uh, something like, yeah, but are you the only school, blah, blah, blah. He said, how many schools do you need to hear of or to see that can do this? Or do you just don't want to believe? Now that's pretty powerful because I can tell people all day long of schools all over the country that do amazing things with kids who grow up in poverty. But the takeaway is how many do you need to change your mind or have you already decided ahead of time that it just won't happen? That's some powerful things to think about, Eric, especially right now, knowing that kids all over the world are getting ready to go back to school. What are some final thoughts that you might have, some just tying it all in together for teachers and parents at this time of year to think about, especially if we don't have the resources and like right now you've got to go send your kids back to distance learning. You might not have a desk and a chair and the kids are sitting at the dining room table. What are some thoughts to just bring some peace for families and teachers as they launch the school year? Many schools are caught up in, and this has happened throughout my whole educational life, they're caught up in trends. I always call it the next shiny object. So something that seems like, oh, there's a good idea, let's do a flipped classroom. Well, no, wait, there's a good idea, let's do triple marking. There's a good idea, we should do this. Like they keep going from one to... Listen, here's what's been working in schools for decades. Stick with the things that work. For example, theater works. Having kids stand up and ask them to become a character from history. How would they stand? How would that person speak? What kind of goals would that person have that you'd like to embody? Another one is dance. When kids learn simple dance moves, it's not just that they're learning coordination and not just that they're revving up their brain, but dance moves can help their brains wire up more connectivity. When the studies are done on kids who struggle with learning in school, surprisingly, the one common thing that neuroscientists see every single time is it's a lack of connectivity in the brain. That's the one single thing. Here's what fosters connectivity. Not the only, but one of the best and the easiest. Dance, theater, learning to play a musical instrument. It could be anything from drumming. It could be dance steps. It could be uh, kids learning to play a wind instrument. But these give kids a sense of control, which is critical. These help wire the brain up to learn habits. These build long-term practice skills. Another thing besides music would of course be physical activity. The, you know, the big shiny trend was years ago is kids should play less in kindergarten and that we should you know, start shoving down more academics. It was a big lie that they got a lot of people to believe in because there is no science behind that. The games that kids play everything from a hopscotch to head and shoulders knees and toes to singing games to movement games red light green light all of those games build self-regulation skills they all raise the blood flow to the brain and juice it up with good chemicals like dopamine norepinephrine dopamine's good for sh for a working memory short-term memory and it's the effort neurotransmitter as well as the reward neurotransmitter. Norepinephrine, you can boost with energizers, activities, uh, taking a little bit of risk, making it a little edgy. And norepinephrine not only narrows focus, which is really good for kids sitting down at a desk, but it's also good for fostering long-term memory. So there's all, so simple tools, like just think of the genre of arts, music, and then a different one of moving your body those can be completely interactive, as in 10 minutes cognitive, 10 minutes back and forth. I took a walk one day with 
one of the premier scientists at the Salk Institute of Biological Studies in La Jolla, which is one of the top five neuroscience institutes in the world. And uh, the, the professor was Dr. Terry Sanowski. And uh, he co-authored a great book on learning how to learn. But I asked him once, I said, if you were teaching a group of kids, and he said, I do that. He said, I teach undergraduates. And I said, okay, when you teach undergraduates, I said, what makes a lot of sense for the brain for the way that you understand how to form better memories and long-term learning? He said, here's what I do. Short lecture, 10 minutes. He said, processing time max 10 minutes and then go take a walk like stop processing it take a walk enjoy nature just see what's out there in the world stop your brain from processing it just let your brain do what it does which means it'll form the long-term memories that you need now notice how simple that was and schools want to make it so complicated mm -hmm. so what i'm saying to the those that are working with kids at home Simple is good. Mm -hmm. Create the buy-in. Create the relevance. Short bursts. And then inter, sort of interpose those with things like movement and music. Because it, you have to take a complete break from the cognitive side or your brain doesn't form those memories because now you're competing with all new information. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eric. This has been eye-opening from the start to understanding what a child needs to learn better all the way through for imagining if you were a teacher in the classroom to me, what things that I can do for my kids uh, doing this distance learning. It's been so helpful. For anyone who wants to learn more about your books, programs, and workshops for schools, they can go to jensenlearning.com. Is that the best place for people to find out about your programs? Yes, it is. Also, if there's, there's many great sites out there about the brain and learning. And so um, uh, we do have a site called brainbasedlearning.net. It's one long word, brainbasedlearning.net. And you can get some free resources there if you'd like. And also many have posted how they've used brain-based learning in classrooms on the site too. So that's another option for everybody. Excellent as well. They can find you on Twitter at Eric Jensen Brain. And do you, do you go on social media a lot or are you too busy for that? I do mostly Twitter and, um, and uh, less of the social media and more of webinars like what we're doing here today. Got it. Well, I hope that people reach out to you and learn some of your workshops, programs, and books, because this is such important information. Thank you so much, Eric. You're so welcome, and best to everybody. Stay safe and be well. Bye-bye.